Mm -hmm. Yes, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Bob, like I'm one of the people who's in the steering committee at CQC, and I'm very proud that we have our first proper industry session here. Uh, I think the, the subject has evolved to the extent that this is completely justified. It's actually much more than justified, as you'll see in a few of the talks which are following now. Uh, let's just get on with it for, because I know this has been a very busy day for the person speaking now. Uh, Ilias Khan, CEO of Cambridge Quantum Computing, so a place I've got something to do with too. And uh, today there were some big events. I don't know whether Ilias will mention them or not. The floor is yours, Ilias. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to make sure I don't share any embarrassing messages. So I'm going to get out a message. And I'm going to do a screen share, which is up now, and I'll change the to full screen. So um, thank you very much indeed. I actually spoke um, last year a little bit uh, similar context, and the ask of me was to try and um, shed some light on the commercialization or the um, business uh, aspects of quantum. And the last one year has been a year of, 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 of lots and lots of um, activity and, of course, a very um, mixed response uh, from the academic and the scientific community versus the business and the investment community, effectively summed up by people on the one hand saying, oh, my God, this is too hypey, it's not real. And on the other people saying, you know, tomorrow we're going to wake up and solve all the world's problems. And, of course, this is not unique to quantum. Uh, over the course, as you can tell from looking at me, I'm actually not young. And so over the course of the last 25, 35, 40 years, there have been many developments in technology that have excited the same responses. So what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes is do a clip um, through a state of, um, of play for, 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 for business. But I'll start by saying that earlier today, some of you may be aware um, Cambridge Quantum, the company that I founded and the company where I'm the chief executive, has merged with Honeywell Quantum Solutions. Honeywell is one of the leading builders of hardware. They have an iron trap um, device, which is a quantum processor. And Honeywell Quantum Systems and Cambridge Quantum Computing have merged into one company to have what is being described as the leading quantum computing company in the world. And I think by, by some margin, it is the leader uh, in terms of numbers of people, in terms of numbers of customers, in terms of technology, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to be the chief executive for the combined business. Now, that in and of itself could occupy the next half an hour. What does it mean and why is it? But I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to stick to my original um, overview, um, which is that you can look at the software development of any compute industry as being mission critical, unless there are algorithms, unless there are software um, applications, the machines are just machines. And that's no different here in the quantum computing business. Um, it really doesn't matter whether you think this is going to happen tomorrow or 25 years from tomorrow. There is a spectrum. There are things that can be done right now. And at Cambridge Quantum, one of the things we do right now is develop a software development toolkit called Ticket. And it allows um, developers to use and access a multiplicity of quantum computers. And then there are some things which are very real. We use quantum computers today to generate keys for cybersecurity that are unhackable, literally, because they're non-deterministic. And that's real. So the next time somebody says, this is 25 years away, it's not real. That's not true. And they're customers because people use these keys. Then there are other things which are not quite real, but accelerating and becoming real. And, and you all know better than me what's happening in the quantum chemistry realm and the machine learning realm and obviously the longer term prospects for quantum AI which is where Bob for example is focused. I wanted to share this um, slide. This is a wagon wheel. On the outside 
of that wheel are about 100, and that not all of them are represented here, but there are at least 150 companies that have, have, have built or are building credibly a quantum computer. And then that 150 can be divided into different platforms, the superconductors, the photonic, the trapped iron, all these different types of methodologies. And then, of course, they can be uh, divided further, if you want, by big companies like Google and smaller companies like OQC, etc. So there's a lot of activity out there. This is not trivial. And in fact, globally, um, if you think about it, all of the large countries have national programs. When's the last time that the United States had a strategic program for a single technology? Well, they do for quantum, and the last time they had that was uh, for the space race. So again, I, I would just urge people to, to, to take this into account. This is quite real. China, Germany, France, the Netherlands, Britain, most countries now, India, have a focus that's strategic. Um, just a couple of this slide just tells you some of the players. Uh, two weeks ago, um, the CEO of um, Google made a statement and said, well, we will have a universal fault tolerant computer by the end of 2028, early 29. So that's the first time I've ever heard of a company make that um, claim. Then um, there are growing numbers of organizations that are beginning to pay for access to quantum computers. Not all of these payments are with a view to having a solution tomorrow. We have clients, we meaning uh, Cambridge Quantum, such as Total, such as Roche, such as Nippon Steel. These are uh, GSK, uh, BP. Now, these are big companies. Y you've got to get up early in the morning to trick them. They don't misunderstand what quantum computers are about. They don't pay for access because somebody has told them that they can solve all their problems tomorrow. So why is it that they're expending capital and budgets now when they weren't last year or the year before? It is because there's a growing informed consensus. For example, in pharmaceuticals, if you're gonna do a drug for a particular problem, it's a five, seven, eight, 10 year journey. And so these organizations think that in the same time scale, use of a quantum computer will be useful for them on that economic basis. Um, I'm not going to do all these numbers. It's a horrible slide to look at. But the point is lots of money, not trivial amounts of money, but lots of money is going into the sector. And this, the, the main message for me is most of this is being spent by people who are young and who have no fear of the past. Again and again and again, when I've spoken to people, the naysayers that don't want to spend money because they're scared are typically people who have been tenured for decades and who have been in this sector where it's only been theoretical. And the younger people obviously don't have such fear. And I think that's where the innovation comes. Um, so I'm really pleased that you've got this magnitude of support for this industry. It really, or this research, I should say, uh, and the German program is, is, is worth it. I am going to stop there because I think we're at 10 past um, and I don't have anything meaningful to say in addition. Bob, are you going to ask a question or shall I stop there? No, that's okay. We can, uh, there usually are questions in the chat, but, but we still got like one or two, three minutes over if you want to say something else because there's no question coming in in the chat. Okay, okay. Well, the only other point I would make is um, I, uh, I mean, this is on a personal basis. You know, I think that we have a, this community, Bob, uh, and you know what I'm about to say. I think this, this community has a responsibility to ensure that in a reasonable, non-emotive manner, we can keep everybody to account. We don't have to be negative if we think somebody's wrong on their expectation, but we can point out with a science-led, um, or should we say a grounded statement, why something might not be uh, for real or why it might take longer. And I'd, I really support this throughout my career, as you know, Bob, I have 
financially and in other ways supported this community. And I think you guys have a critical role to play. I'm a big fan of the Unitary Fund. Uh, as you might know, I'm the chairman of the Topos Institute because um, young Brendan, brilliant young Brendan, by the way, is going to be speaking to you soon. And you all know how wonderful he is, one of my favorite people on the planet. And we have a responsibility to support the directness, but using a language that allows us to build constructively on it. We don't have to fight each other all the time. And so kudos to this community and, you know, good on you. And I am very, very, very enthusiastic about continuing to see how we can be science led, but at the same time, transparent. My last point, Bob, transparent is two things. There's transparency of action, but then there's transparency of intent. You know, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we saying what we're saying? And I love this. Um, well, I keep on saying I love, I've run out of adjectives. I'm really inspired by this um, category theory approach to transparency and intent, because you don't look at the action, you don't look at what's being done, you look at the connections with the consequences, and, and, and suddenly you start seeing a landscape, uh, and I was inspired in this by um, a dinner I had with you, Bob, three or four years ago now, so, you know, that's the last thing I'll say, and then I'll move on. Yeah, I think, I think Ilias, we, I mean, I'm just talking on part of the community here, but I think we should thank you because these, evo the evolution, these developments also probably are part of the reason that QPL just got double number of submissions this year, which I see John Selby there, the organizer, <laughs> had a lot of trouble with dealing with. And I don't know whether Kohei is here, who was the PC chair, had a lot of trouble dealing with sudden doubling of the number of submissions, which we saw this year which was a little bit crazy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ilias. Like, uh, like, you, you know, Constantinos is here with me. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, well, is that really him or is he? That's is him. He, he's that's, real. That's me. I'm that's not him. He's not a, it's not a skeleton. He's not, not a, a doll. <laughs> Anyway, listen, thank you, everyone, and thank you for your enthusiasm. And over to uh, Brendan. Brendan, are you in uh, California? Yeah, I am. I'm in San Francisco at the moment. Great, great. Wonderful. Say hi to all my friends there. Will do. Will do. Thanks, Elias. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank congratulations. You. Um, Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Brendan. I heard the congratulations. Thank you. The red room. The red room. Oh, dear. Okay, I made a big mistake, and uh, am I yes, I said I called like Kohei the PC chair, but Kohei is doing ACT, so I got a bit confused. Like the PC chairs were Miriam and Chris Ernan. <laughs> so, sorry about. It. So let's start with. Yeah, there's too much stuff going on. Some space like oh, no, I get confused. Uh, okay, we start now with Brandon, who's going to speak on part of the Topos Institute. Sorry, I'll just get my slides off. Um, am I next on the program? I hope I'm not taking someone else's spot. Um, um, I think that Greg was supposed to go next. Uh, he's here. We didn't okay. know he was here, but he's actually here. Uh, so, what would you prefer? Or what would Frank prefer, I guess? Yeah, is, we, we can stick to the program uh, okay. now. Uh, we see, we know that Craig is here uh, in case that he needs to then uh, go. Mm -hmm. so, so, okay. Sorry for the, for the confusion. All right. Uh, I shared my screen. People can hear me. People can see the screen. Yep, that's great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, now I can see Craig. Uh, welcome, Greg. Welcome to QPL. Thank you for contributing to our first business session. Uh, floor is yours. Uh, sure. So uh, I will say when I originally was asked to do this, I didn't know it was in the business session. Actually, I thought it was just like a 45 minute invited talk. So like three days ago, I realized I have to cut this thing down to 15 minutes. And it's not about the business. It's about a tool that I made. But hopefully people still find it interesting. Uh, so anyways, 
In this very short talk, I'm going to introduce STIM, which is a tool that I wrote for fast analysis of and fast sampling of stabilizer circuits. Um, before I get into the specific things that STIM can do, I, I want to talk about what got me interested in writing a tool like this in the first place. Like, how does a person end up in a situation where they find themselves writing a fast stabilizer simulator? What would bring them to that? Uh, first of all, circuit simulators are just sort of inherently useful, uh, particularly for quantum error correction research. If you're a QEC researcher who just came up with some new way to do an operation in the surface code, the gold standard way of checking if that is actually working is to simulate it. And unfortunately, these simulations can be pretty expensive because the circuits tend to be quite large. Uh, several of my coworkers told me that, you know, for them, historically, the bottleneck step in validating construction is not decoding the syndrome, but it's actually generating the samples from the circuit. And I found that pretty surprising, and fixing that was part of the reason that, that I made a tool like this. Uh, the second motivation that sort of drove me to this was a desire to explore. Like, I like making tools where you can, you know, with your hands, interactively edit circuits. And the tool then deals with telling you the consequences of the changes you make. So quite a lot of my papers are from messing around in some tool for doing this, like my drag and drop simulator quirk, and just noticing something interesting. Uh, but error corrected circuits tend to be extremely large, and interacting with something tends to feel awful if it takes more than a second to get answers to your questions. So if I want to use that kind of interactive editing technique, I need a really fast simulator. Uh, and the last motivation is sort of the spirit of competition. You know, it's just kind of fun to make something that's better than what's been done before. And when it comes to taking a lot of samples from a stabilizer circuit, STIM definitely hits that mark. So you can see here in this particular benchmark that I'm showing of sampling a surface code circuit a thousand times, STIM is 10,000 times faster than the competition. Uh, you can see other benchmarks that aren't quite so biased towards the strengths of STIM uh, in the archive paper in the, the bottom right that introduces it. So that covers why I worked on STIM. Uh, but what can actually do? What, what sorts of things would you use it for? First of all, uh, it can do fast bulk sampling of measurements in a circuit. So this behind the scenes, this is done using a Tableau simulator to get an initial noiseless sample from the circuit or, or really any simulator to get an initial noiseless sample. Once you have that noiseless sample, you can get more samples or, or true samples by tracking how errors flip or don't flip measurements and diffing that against the reference sample. So STIM does that and it does all of it using vectorized instructions, which apply the same operation to multiple things at the same time, which makes things much faster. So for example, in the frame simulator, which is tracking the error frames, instead of just tracking one error frame, STIM tracks hundreds of frames all interleaved with each other so that it can apply a gate to hundreds of frames with a single instruction instead of with 100 separate instructions. In addition to sampling measurements, STEM can do fast bulk sampling of detection events. Uh, a detection event is basically just a more complicated meta measurement where you're checking if some comparison of measurements has come out wrong, indicating the presence of an error. Most syndrome decoders only care about detection events, not raw measurements. And that's actually great because detection events are only defined in terms of deviations from expected behavior. You care a lot about whether or not a measurement was flipped. You don't care so much whether the unflipped measurement was gonna be on or off. And algorithmically this translates into being allowed to just set the reference sample to zero. And since getting the reference sample is often one of the most expensive parts of simulating a circuit, this makes detection event sampling much more efficient. Um, third, there's sort of a meta use case, which is that you can use the classes and operations available in STEM as building blocks for making your own tools. So STEM has classes for representing common stabilizer circuit concepts like tableaus and poly products, and it has high performance methods for operating on those types. So for example, STEM can multiply poly strings or it can compute the inverse of a stabilizer tableau and it can do those things pretty quickly. And if you're doing work with stabilizer circuits, having fast operations like that and having these pre-built types that you don't have to write yourself is, is very handy. The last use case that I wanted to mention is converting a circuit into a matching graph or, or more generally just rewriting the errors of a circuit, which normally you think of as applying to qubits to instead be errors in a more abstract system where they act on detection events and logical observables. 
This more abstract format is the one that decoders tend to work with. So for example, Oscar Higgett recently put out a decoder called Pi Matching, and I was able to test out that decoder on stim circuits pretty quickly by using this error analysis conversion to turn the circuits into a matching graph and writing some glue code to enter that matching graph into Pi Matching. So that's a quick summary of what STIM can do. Uh, now let's go over some examples of actually using STIM. Uh, originally, I wanted to do this live, like typing into a Python interpreter and showing the results being evaluated, but that's not really plausible in a 15 minute talk. So instead you'll just have to be satisfied with screenshots. Uh, first up, this is what it looks like to sample a circuit. So what we're looking at here is a Python interpreter. The first line uh, here, this here, is importing STIM. And uh, this is actually a development version of STIM, which includes some circuit generation utilities. So if you install the Python package, you won't have this next method, but it's not really key to the demo exactly. The, the whole point of this next line is to just generate a big circuit. So it's making a surface code circuit. This circuit has a thousand rounds and the code distance is big enough that each round is going to measure roughly a thousand stabilizers. Uh, then we ask STIM to run a thousand shots of the circuit and tell us all the measurement results. So we asked for a thousand, thousand, thousand measurements, which is a billion measurements. And as you can see here, that took about three seconds. Um, this, this is pretty good performance. It's, you can do a little bit better if you ask for like bit packed results and, and other complicated things. But I think for someone using the tool for the first time, this is maybe representative of what you, what you could expect. Um, now, I wanted to give a demo that would be maybe more compelling to the sort of person who attends QPL. And I noticed that the person chairing the session, like it was one of the co-inventors of the ZX calculus. So I figured why not make a demo around that? So what I did is I wrote a tool using STIM as a building block for analyzing a stabilizer ZX graph uh, for figuring out its stabilizer generators. So this is, this is not something that's native to STIM, just to be clear. This is an example of using STIM to do something that's related to stabilizer circuits to, to build another tool. Uh, anyways, what I did was uh, I wrote some code which will take a text diagram of ZX graph. So right here, you can see the text diagram. And uh, the first thing it does is it just parses that text diagram into a more traditional representation of a graph. Um, I, I didn't use STIM for this. This is just you know Python code. Um, then that graph is uh, processed behind using stim behind the scenes. I'll go over exactly what in a second to compute the stabilizer generators and then it's printing out the stabilizer generators. So here you can see we started with you know what looks like a pretty complicated graph and it might be uh, it might be a little tricky to figure out what it does or to optimize it down. you might have to apply a lot of rewrite rules. But if you do this analysis you can then see, oh there's you know there's just two stabilizer generators for this. They're the stabilizer generators of an S gate and so you could just output the S gate graph. And you could see how this would be potentially useful as some sort of step in an optimization workflow because the stabilizer generators of a graph are independent of its form. They only depend on its function. So no matter how complicated you make the graph look, it, it just immediately cuts it down to this minimal representation. Uh, so here's, here's sort of what the workflow looks like. Uh, first, the ZX graph is converted into a stabilizer circuit piece by piece. And this translation is trivially correct, but it produces circuits that use post selection. So this, this here is a, a post selection. It's required that this measurement returns zero. Um, second, that circuit is run through STIM's Tableau simulator. And anytime a post selection is encountered, a method called measure kickback is used. And uh, what this method does is it returns the measurement result, but it also returns the Pali product that flips you to the state that you would have been in if the opposite measurement result had occurred. So if you have a stabilizer circuit operating on stabilizer states, it's always the case that you can find such a Pali product if, if the measurement has a random outcome. Um, the method will also tell you if the measurement has a deterministic outcome. So if the measurement is deterministically wrong, you can you know, throw an error saying that you gave me a graph with a contradiction in it, you know, a graph that will evaluate to the zero tensor. Um, once, once we have this normal stabilizer circuit with these post selections replaced by measurements with conditional kickbacks to get them back onto the correct trajectory, we can you know, run that through STIM's stabilizer simulator and use a method on it to get the canonical stabilizers. So just the, 
the generators of stabilizers that describe the state. And if we combine that with the state channel duality, instead of getting the stabilizers of you know, one output state, we can get the stabilizers of the channel. And these stabilizers will be the stabilizer generators of the original graph. They, they are a complete description of what the, the graph does. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's sort of everything that I wanted to show is uh, very fast. I was, I was a bit worried I wouldn't actually get the full 15 minutes. Uh, but in summary, STEM is a fast library for working with and sampling from stabilizer circuits. If that sounds interesting to you, please check out the GitHub repository or the Python package. If you have questions about how to do things, send me an email, ask on the quantum computing stack exchange, open a GitHub issue, I'm happy to help out. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, thanks, Craig, for that. Uh, yeah, sorry for the misunderstanding if that happened. Uh, well, so it's freely available for one, right? Yes, yeah, there's, there's no okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the ZX community will ask you to give another talk about this because I see Alex Kissinger saying, whoa, <laughs> in, the, in the comment. Uh, Alex, <laughs> Alex, you want to say something about that? Or Richie? Uh, I, don't, I don't think I have much more beyond whoa to say right now, but, but this, this looks really impressive and I think we're, we're all gonna have a look at it. Yeah, thank you. Are you referring to the, the demo or the, the sampling speed? I'm actually interested. Well, it was it was first about the speed, but 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 also I I like I like the the demo as as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've, it is, we've, we've it is kind nice of, to we've be kind able... of got our own way of computing stabilizers for a ZX diagram. So maybe sometime we should we should chat about that. Yeah, yeah. I will say I like I, I tend to think in terms of the stabilizers instead of the graphs. So for me, it's very nice to be able to just when I want to, you know, throw away the graph and just talk about what it does. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Greg. This was great. And I'm sure the, you, you're gonna get a lot of people coming back to you about this. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and mute myself. So we now, so now we have got Brandon talking on behalf of the Unitary Fund. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. The Opus Institute. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm confusing everything. Sorry, Brandon. No worries, Bob. Uh -oh. Did, so, didn't we know the paper with Will at some point? No. I did connect with Will recently. Uh, we had a great conversation. <laughs> we'll be speaking again soon. Uh -oh. there's, there's a lot to, to collaborate on. Okay, uh, shall I get started? Yep. Yes, please. Okay, great. Well, th thanks, Bob, for the introduction. Um, it's nice to be at QPL. QPL was the, the first conference I attended as a grad student of Bob's, um, and also the first place I had a paper accepted. So it's um, nice. And while I haven't been out, I sort of engaged much in the conference this year due to time zones and other commitments. Um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity now, grateful to have the opportunity to share um, and introduce a project I've been a part of for a couple of years now, uh, but has really launched in earnest uh, this past January. Um, this, this project is Topos. So I was looking over the, um, the, the QPL website this year, just, just glancing at the talks, and I noticed this wonderful statement at the top just characterizing what QPL is about. Uh, QPL is an annual conference that brings together researchers working on mathematical foundations of quantum physics, quantum computing, and related areas with a focus on structural perspectives and the use of logical tools, ordered algebraic and category theoretic structures, formal languages, semantical methods, and other computer science techniques applied to the study of physical behavior in general. Um, and what I thought um, is that this is a good entry point also into to what we do and what motivates us at Topos. So to adapt this slightly, um, a first approximation to, to Topos is the idea that we're not a conference, not an annual conference, but a new science nonprofit that brings together researchers working on mathemat mathematical foundations now of technologies of connection integration, which uh, we believe is very much related to, to quantum computation, um, but coming at it from a, a slightly different angle. Um, 
and related areas with a focus on structural perspectives and so on, applied to the study of, of systems and systems of all sorts uh, from sort of the, the more uh, formal sort of information or computational cognitive systems to more generally sort of physical, economic, social systems. Um, and what I found sort of really, really beautiful about this, uh, this statement, this QPL statement now sort of adapted to Topos too, is it's a statement of belief in, in the power of mathematics in particular structural mathematics and sort of it's, it's motivated in the hope, it's a very hopeful statement that the structural insight uh, leads to, for example, technological advances such as quantum computing. And this is something that, that very much motivates us um, at Topos. So to put it perhaps a little too boldly um, and blatantly, there's, there's a belief that somehow new mathematics sometimes changes the world. Um, and often, uh, and this is a very mathematical audience, so maybe I could use a more sophisticated example, but often to gesture at this in, in other audiences, uh, it's interesting to reflect on, for example, what uh, the switch to Hindu Arabic numerals, positional uh, place-based number system sort of ha has gained uh, above, for example, Roman numerals. And the idea that, you know, imagine doing physics, working with Hilbert spaces or, or trying to explore space by, through, through the use of, of a numerical system like the Roman numerals. Um, somehow this sort of, what might seem like a slight structural shift or a new structural perspective uh, unlocks uh, a whole lot of sort of new technologies that uh, strongly shape the world. So perhaps more grounded um, and, and more grounded in this community in particular, it's been really interesting to watch the last almost two decades now um, where we had this shift um, towards categorical quantum mechanics. Again, this sort of structural insight that motivates QPL and motivates Topos. Um, and from this and through the work of of, a, of this community and, and the wider community over a number of years, we see the sequence through from categorical quantum mechanics through things like the ZX calculus and, and Discocat models of, of natural language uh, leading to now, I think the cusp of, as Ilias spoke about, uh, really powerful emerging new technologies like, like quantum natural language processing um, that have the power to sort of radically reshape aspects of our world. And so, I think to, to state this seriously and to sort of think about it, it, it leads to questions sort of what mathematics do we want to develop to with this, with this intent? Um, how does change happen? Indeed, how do we want the world to change if we are to play in, indeed sort of with humility, um, a small role in, in this process, but nonetheless a role in this process of developing new, new structural insights that drive technology. Um, and we believe these structural methods, in particular category theory, speak to, at their core, themes of connection integration, um, elucidating structures that are, are very important, I think, to humanity and, and our sort of ways of relating to each other. Indeed, as Ilya spoke, uh, a way of sort of phrasing the world through examination of relationships and context, uh, putting at core ideas of sort of robust translation or communication, and indeed the cooperation that that leads to. So that's sort of the, the theme that Topos has chosen to build itself around. There's a, a mathematics, a, a science of connection integration and the technologies that um, might result. Um, but we believe that this, this particular approach also responds to the needs of the moment. I mean, we are, uh, as, a, as a sort of species, uh, are continuing to build technologies of connection, um, say, say sort of, from, from technologies like the internet and, and social media to technologies like global systems of, of trade and, and markets. And I think it's becoming increasingly clear sort of witnessing technology development uh, over the past couple of decades that these technologies of connections have had unanticipated consequences from this pandemic to climate change to problems of disinformation. And so while these technologies are being developed with the aims of enriching humanity, somehow there's uh, unanticipated consequences, a lack of alignment of the result with our intentions. And again, while mathematicians and, and mathematics is not the whole story, 
uh, and these are deep sort of multifaceted complex problems, we believe at least that a deeper understanding of connection integration can help us align systems with intentions and help us cooperate for, for a better or more sort of equitable, just, caring world. And so this is Topos in a sentence. Uh, Topos is a new independent nonprofit devoted to shaping technology for public benefit by advancing sciences of connection integration. So we launched in this year, this past January, um, and indeed we're only thinking about sort of in-office work starting next month because of the pandemic. But how do we make this, this concrete or what do we do with this mission? Um, we launched with three initial research themes running from sort of the, the pure science to the, and, and mathematics to sort of more, to understanding the process of building technology um, that, that results from this mathematics and has this sort of aim of, of connecting and integrating things at its core. Um, so on the left-hand side uh, it is sort of, for left to right is sort of the science or mathematics to technology spectrum here. Um, and we ask questions for like, what are the right abstractions or, or right structures for talking about distributed intelligence for collective cognition, for systems that, that compute and, and do things like, uh, I don't know, like, like brains or, or like uh, trade systems that allocate resources. Um, and here we use methods from sort of category theory, such as sort of polynomial functors to model dynamical or decision-making systems. We have, uh, people working inspired by neuroscience and things like theories of Carl Friston to talk about um, uh, essentially the nature of cognition. And the aim is to sort of produce better abstractions from, um, from these methods to talk about so some, some new theorems, new structures, new perhaps type theories, programming languages to uh, better answer questions, for example, like how, how do we keep our AI systems safe in appropriate ways? Um, in the middle, we, we moved to sort of software development uh, and in particular around scientific computing, um, thinking about how we, we structure and compute with scientific models, how we can merge different sort of people can specify formally different sort of models or scientific theories and how they can be merged to sort of create some um, collective understanding. For example, uh, in, in this sort of, in this uh, left-hand corner of, of the middle, sorry, lower left-hand corner of the middle column, uh, there's a, a representation of some model of um, pen, pandemic um, dynamics, that is or a disease flow that is stitched together from a variety of primitives, uh, but it's a formal artifact and can be used to extract um, so these, these infection over time curves. And then on the right-hand side, we're, we're thinking about questions around mathematical knowledge and how do we build tools to share and navigate mathematical knowledge, building both from sort of NLP uh, techniques, but also proof assistance and formalized mathematics. Um, and part of, part of the motivation for the right-hand side is about sort of giving access to mathematical knowledge as well. Um, and in particular, I think the, the research frontier, as we think about shaping tools for public benefit, it's important that we engage the public and they're involved in various ways and are welcome into these, these spaces of, of new knowledge. Um, and so, uh, a big part of what we do indeed is about around public engagement and, and how we uh, yeah, involve the, the public into shaping technology for public benefit. So this comes through, for example, public exposition. We have a, a number of seminar series and, and videos posted on, on the YouTube page. Uh, we support organizations, through, we provide administrative support for, for example, the category theory uh, research wiki, the NLAB. Uh, we, we're launching a blog in the coming month. Um, and then we also support community development activities, training grad students, um, emphasizing that providing entryways for, for new people into this sort of research in this field uh, with a particular focus on ensuring that we, we can build an appropriately diverse and accessible field. Uh, but looking forward, uh, I think what, what's important is to even is to move further into, for example, research into the impacts of, of our technology. So research into technology and science um, at technology and society and, and the ethical implications of uh, the potential uses of what we're doing. And 
also then to, to work to inform public dialogue and public policy around these emerging technologies. So as a, as a society, we can uh, gather and think about how they're used and ensure that, say, appropriately structured or governed to work for the benefit of all. So behind all this work, there is a large and growing team, which I am very appreciative of. Um, and indeed, many members of this community are part of this project. Um, I've spoken to Bob a lot about this. Uh, Ilias mentioned he's, he's the chairman of our board. Uh, I know Sean, Sean Tull spends a lot of time um, at, in this sort of space. Um, he's a key part of this community. Um, and we're also um, indeed incredibly grateful for a number of um, sponsors and donors, of which I, I just name a few here. Uh, but what's especially encouraging to me is the way that our support ranges across society from individuals to sort of philanthropic foundations to government support to indeed industry organizations like CQC. Um, I think this bodes very well for our ability to sort of bring together society or around these aims and have this sort of cross-sectional uh, both engagement and, and influence. And so finally on that note, uh, I think that the importance of community is really strong at Topos. Um, and I would just like to end with an invitation to, if you'd like more information um, or if you'd like to get involved to, to reach out. Um, I, I very much, um, as Ilya said too, uh, this community is a great community and I, I really love the QPL community to be very much more involved in, in what we're doing. So thank you. Thanks, Brandon, for uh, thanks, Brandon, for this. Like, yeah, it's, uh, obviously, people need to know better about this and that this exists and stuff like that. Like, uh, and how we can collabor collaborate with all of this. I'm now checking the the comments. John Selby said, "Thanks." Is there anybody who has a question here? There's a lot more to explain, obviously. Yeah, I'll also be available in um, the in Gather Town after in the poster session. I mean, I mean, the, the the chat goes on because in the previous talk with Craig, like the chat went on too, like, like after mm -hmm. the talk. So obviously, that's that's one place to start, and then the next one is Gather Town. So now we move to, so so basically, we had like two two profit organizations here in principle, principle as far as. Uh, people contributing to this session goes because it's kind of obvious that the. The non-profit stuff is very important too. For example, Perimetry Institute was very important to this community too. I mean, everybody who's been, been in this community for a while knows how important Perimetry Institute was. I don't know whether Lucian is here or, or another representative from, from Perimetry. But, so the next one is also non-profit, uh, which is the Unitary Fund. I mean, I mean it, I'm sorry that it may sound slightly uh, I don't know why they put me on the chair because both Brandon and, and Will Zeng, who is the head of the Unitary Fund, I think, is a, where my PhD student. So I'm happy it's not Will here, but I'm very happy to welcome Sarah Kaiser, who's going to represent the Unitary Fund. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Totally. Hello. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Cool. Yes. Thanks, yes. Brendan. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm here today to talk to you, as mentioned, about the Unitary Fund um, and kind of the work that we're doing, uh, growing the kind of open quantum community. Sarah, are you sharing at the moment? Uh, so my role there is basically um, I'm both a technical staff and a quantum com and a quantum community lead. Um, I have a background in and a PhD in quantum computing, especially uh, quantum optics stuff. Um, and kind of over the last couple of years, I've kind of grown into more like a quantum developer advocate sort of role. So I do a lot Sarah, of live Sarah, are you Twitch. sharing your screen? <laughs> Everybody can kind of watch me make mistakes <laughs> with semicolons and stuff. I've written some books. Um, and I just really enjoy engaging with this community and trying to find ways to enable people to contribute. So yeah. um, and now I'm at the Unitary Fund. So how can we actually build quantum technologies uh, together? Uh, as probably a lot of us know, the quantum ecosystem is open. So there's been kind of a very intentional choice, you know, as, as we're developing these technologies 
to make them open source. And I think that has been a really big benefit both to the field and both to the accessibility of people contributing to the field uh, writ large. So um, our, our kind of mission statement here is creating a technology ecosystem that benefits the most people. Uh, this often kind of seems like specifically open source software, but it's kind of more expansive than that. So um, we do two main things. One, we give out uh, micro grants, uh, which are basically 4K, no strings attached uh, grants to work on quantum tech projects. Um, this can include the obvious things like compilers, simulators, um, libraries, but it also includes educational tools as well as like community efforts, um, whether it be like groups at universities or, or more global sorts of uh, communities. Um, and you can see we have uh, tons of uh, industry supporters <laughs> uh, to, to enable us to do this. Um, uh, so yeah, and the other thing that we do is um, we kind of have our own research group uh, called Unitary Fund Labs. And our goal with that is, well, we understand the quantum open source ecosystem pretty well. <laughs> And we wanted to leverage that expertise uh, to try and find gaps that kind of existed in the ecosystem and build the tools that are needed to fill those. Um, so currently our, our lab project is um, building MITIC, which is an open source error mitigation, error mitigating compiler. Um, you can check this out on GitHub because it's obviously open source. <laughs> um, and we also support a lot of other um, kind of open source efforts in the community, including Qtip. Um, we uh, also kind of do con consulting uh, for startups and stuff to kind of help them either leverage open source tools or open source their own tools. Um, and we have a lot of research collaborations along those lines as well. Um, with a variety of different universities, especially ones that are working on open source projects. So to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of how impactful um, our, our work has been so far, uh, we've funded almost 50 projects now um, at this about 4K level. And um, we've seen incredible uh, results out of this. So, um, tons and tons of stars, contributors, and new open source projects, but as well, two new startups, <laughs> um, over seven new people in the industry. Um, and this spans 21 countries and has generated um, over 10 publications. There's quite a few that are in progress right now. Um, and all of this for about 150K. <laughs> uh, so to talk a little bit more about our current labs, uh, Unitary Fund Labs <laughs> research project. Um, basically, quantum computers have errors. Um, and MITIC is basically a way that you can, can use classical algorithms to kind of make near-term hardware a little bit more accessible um, and robust. It's you know, kind of part way between running your circuit just as is and you know, the entirely intractable overhead of full fault tolerance. Uh, so that's, that's the actual project, but one of the other things that we do kind of, I think, really cool with this is we do all of our development in open, in the open, which does not just mean in open source on GitHub, but we actually do all of our sprints, all of our meetings, um, planning, basically publicly on our Discord. We run a pretty active Discord with over a thousand people on it. And tons of folks just kind of drop in and listen to what we're talking about. Um, it's really been really, really cool to see folks that kind of like lurk in those meetings. <laughs> and then after a couple of weeks, uh, actually start making contributions to, to MITIC. And so um, I think that has been a, a pretty successful um, experiment. <laughs> uh, the other thing that actually just concluded um, kind of along those lines of really open community participation is we ran a hackathon called Unitary Hack. Um, and we're, we're still getting a few results trickling in, but the idea was basically to motivate people with swag and, and cash bounties um, to actually contribute to quantum open source projects. Um, and we had over 60 contributions to, I think about 20 different um, 
quantum open source projects. I think over 30 new contributors to the quantum open source like community. <laughs> some of them uh, hadn't even done any open source stuff before. Some had done classical open source and, and now kind of expanded to quantum. Uh, so again, I think that's a really cool impact that we're having on the community. Um, with respect to the microgrants as well, I just kind of want to give you a, a taste of some of the things that uh, we've funded that have um, that are pretty cool. So these are a couple of the open source software packages. Um, we actually heard of one previously that Craig was talking about um, uh, pie matching. Uh, so that that's pretty cool that that's also a unitary fund funded project. Uh, but yeah, we you know. Here we see some simulators, circuit layouts, um, networking, kind of higher level networking protocols. Some of the kind of open education uh, initiatives that we funded include <laughs> things as wide as uh, quantum fairy tales. <laughs> Someone took a bunch of uh, quantum algorithms and kind of adapted them to fairy tale situations. Uh, we main, maintain a lot of resources for open source maintainers and uh, also fund open source textbooks uh, like quantumalgorithms.org. Um, and the other, the other kind of uh, community component of this, really it, our goal is to, to build up a global quantum workforce. And so we funded things like the immensely successful Qubit by Qubit, QWorld, uh, which is one of my favorite groups. Uh, it started out of um, some folks in, in Eastern Europe, and now they have what they call Q cousins <laughs> uh, pretty much all over the world. And they develop a lot of really cool curriculum and, and um, like certification programs. So uh, how can you <laughs> help out and, and grow the, the open quantum community? Um, Obviously, ch check out our resources. You can help us by spreading the word, um, becoming a supporter, um, bug, bug your companies and or universities to, to help sponsor open source. Um, we're always also looking for kind of mentors and participation uh, on the Discord to help guide some of these projects um, and contribute code. <laughs> um, there, I think, are quite a few people here in, in the audience uh, who who regularly work on quantum open source stuff. So uh, I thank you for your <laughs> contributions and I look forward to more. So um, let's make uh, the open quantum community welcoming and safe for everyone to contribute. Thank you, Sarah. You're very right yep. about